so excited to be able to present to you guys today. Today's webinar is like a part two to my previous webinar of overcoming debt and building wealth. Um, I traditionally do that one. So if you guys have not gotten to watch that one, I highly encourage you guys to jump over to YouTube. You can go watch it after this one today. It's kind of a precursor. Uh, you can just go into the search bar, type in overcoming debt and building wealth, and it should pop right up. Uh, today, we're going to dive deeper into how we can start building wealth, overcoming our fears of the market, and debunking some of these common myths when it comes to wealth building. Um, versus my previous webinar kind of digs deeper into how to set yourself up to get to this point where you start building wealth. So I think it's super important. If you haven't gone to watch that, go watch that one and then you can jump um, and watch this one as well. But uh, you will hear me say this over and over again, that building wealth is a marathon. It is not a race. And just like with all marathon runners, there's a lot of training and there's a lot of prep work to sell, to set yourself up for success. And the same goes with wealth, wealth building. And no one accidentally wins in life. If you want to win, it has to be an intentional act. So I'm just here to help encourage, help build your confidence to wealth building, and hopefully by the end of this webinar, inspire you a little bit. So on that note, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna jump right in. We are going to talk a little bit about some myths and some things you don't need, and I just wanna debunk them a little bit. A lot of people believe that successful, wealthy people, you need to be one of these three things. You need a large income or a degree in finance. You need to take large risks. But the truth of the matter is, is you don't need any of these things to start building wealth. So let's go to the first stereotype. First thing you don't need, a large income. Is this helpful for getting you to point A to point B faster? 100% but this is not necessary. What matters most is how you utilize the income you have, big or small. I have seen people with a six-figure income live paycheck to paycheck more times than not, simply just because they're trying to keep up their lifestyle. And I'm gonna be honest, when my husband and I first started to build wealth, we did not have much for income. I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. We were living on one income, but all we knew was that it was important to start early and invest often. So we started small, we did what we could with what we had, and we worked our way up to investing more, creating that discipline that we have now. So I think it's important to note that starting small is okay. It's just the habit of investing consistently is what matters here. Second thing we don't need, we do not need a degree in finance to do this. That is most certainly helpful to have an education behind wealth building. However, it does not automatically mean that you are going to be wealthy. Again, your actions do. Uh, I have an illustration that I'm gonna chat about. I grew up in the country, like full blown farming country on a full running dairy farm. We had farmers all around us and some would argue that farmers don't make much in their lifetime. Well, recently, one of the farmers that I grew up with passed away over the last couple of years and come to find out he left his family with over a million dollars that he invested himself with over time. And I just think that it's important to recognize that, that someone who doesn't have a very large income invested over time, didn't have a degree in finance. Some would say that he lived a very um, simple life, retired and left his family with a pretty modest inheritance. Some of you are probably thinking, how in the world did this, did this farmer retire a millionaire? Farmers understand consistently, consistency. They have to tend to their fields and their crops every day. They have to plant seeds every single year consistently by investing in their land. They understand that in order for this field to take off, they have to be there every single day, making that choice every single day to invest in it. Every year when I was growing up, I would watch this man. He would walk into his field. He would he would tend to them, getting rid of things that didn't belong, fertilizing, mowing, you name it. And every single year, he always had a really great harvest. He used his disciplines that he learned on his farm to build wealth and invest. And his consistency paid off over time, even on a farmer's income. 
Um, it showed not only in his crops every year, but when he passed away and he left his family with that pretty modest inheritance. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's no, that's no way to live your life, right? To work um, your whole life just to retire and pass away years later. But I can promise you that this man lived a very, very great retirement and he did everything that he wanted to do and then some. Uh, third thing you don't need, you do not need to take large risks. If taking risks is something you like to do, then by all means, go, you, you can go do that. However, I think it's a huge misconception that for you to retire a millionaire, uh, you have to take these massive risks. And when in, although investing is a risk and reward relationship, you can stay more on the safe side with a lot less risk and still retire with wealth. And I'm going to talk about how we can do that later on this call. But in the meantime, let's talk about some roadblocks to building wealth. Uh, first roadblock is your current lifestyle. More often than not, this is something that everyone struggles with because you have to tell yourself no, right? No to that new car, no to the luxurious vacation or whatever material item is next on your list. And you might certainly certainly deserve all of those things. I'm not knocking you on that, but that's how we always justify the purchase, right? I've worked so hard that I'm going to reward myself with this one thing. And then that one thing turns into two, which turns into three. And then the next thing we know, a majority of our income is going towards all these payments that we just agreed to pay because we're trying to keep up with this lifestyle that's just not suitable for us. Uh, second roadblock to building wealth is debt. This is probably in the top three of roadblocks that get in the way of people building wealth. When all of your income is going to payment, you have no margin to work with with building wealth. The number one tool to building wealth is your income. Roadblock number three is your lack of understanding. This is very very common with the older and the younger generation. With this older generation, I hear, well, no one taught me any of this, or it's too late for me, and I'm just going to have to work for the rest of my life. And then you hear the younger generation who is just saying, you know, investing is too complicated, so I just would rather stay in the dark. Then open themselves up to the one tool that can make them wealthy that every single person has access to. I also see this younger version tell me all about these get rich quick schemes and ideas. And although I love their enthusiasm, more often than not, there's no easy way to get rich quick, as they say. Again, I'm going to keep saying this over and over again on this call. Investing is a marathon. It is not a race. If you do not understand investing, I encourage you to reach out to someone who's going to teach you because your future is too important not to learn about this. Do not keep yourself in the dark. There are plenty of people out there, including myself, who want to help you understand. Um, which brings me to my fourth roadblock to building wealth, which is the fear of the future. Once I sit down with people and explain what investing and the stock market is, that fear of the future diminishes just a little bit. However, there are some people who fear the stock market so much so that they let that fear control their choices where they don't even participate in the stock market. And with that, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into that topic on my next slide because I feel that it's very important, especially since we've just overcome one of the worst stock market dips since 2008. This and a lack of understanding are probably the number one roadblocks to building wealth, and I'll dig into those deeper in just a second. Um, but our fifth roadblock would be our instilled beliefs. When you grow up in your whole life, when you grow up with your when you grow up your whole life with your parents and your siblings and your family and your friends telling you that the stock market is evil or will always live this way, that gets in the way of you making your first step to building wealth. And that's just to get started. You don't believe that it's possible for you to even start. And I hope that no one on this call believes that because remember, I myself did not start with much. We started on a one income family. I was a stay at home mom. And you will hear me say this a lot too, that the only losers in this game are the ones who never start. So now let's jump back to that fear of the future and the stock market here. Fear is a really funny thing. 
If you let it, it can control the way that you live your life. The best way to overcome your fear is with facts. So that's why I have my fear versus facts up here. Um, we've recently been doing this with our daughter. So I have six-year-old twins at home, and one of them has been waking up in the middle of the night with bad dreams. So if she comes into our bedroom in the middle of the night, first off, that scares the heck out of me because I'm not sure if there are any parents on this call on this webinar, but I think everyone will agree with me that there is nothing more scarier than a four foot black shadow next to your bed in the middle of the night, right? So she comes into my room, she tells my husband and I that she has bad dreams and she tells us what the dream is about. And my husband will start going over facts with her in the present moment. First, the front door is locked so no one can get in the house. Two, unicorn fairies with six legs, honey, they're not real. Next, three, no one can trap you in your room because it doesn't have a lock on it. You know, and because, and before anybody asks in our Q&A, yes, these are all real fears that my daughter has had in the middle of the night. Sometimes I just feel like uh, my life could be a reality show. So <laughs> um, back, jumping back on this train though, Everything around us wants to control our emotions. Fear is all over the news. All you have to do is turn on the TV, right? You have the fear of the economy. You have the fear of the stock market, fear of the pandemic, baby soap, you name it. All these news outlets everywhere are here to pull on our heartstrings and control our fear. So let's overcome them with some facts, okay? What is the stock market? The stock market in itself is almost like a living, breathing organism, right? It's been around since the 1100s. A lot of people feel Fear the stock market so much that they are willing to put that fear at the forefront instead of participating. And a lot of people I talk to, uh, they know that investing is out there and that it's a really good thing to do, yet they don't want to learn about it because they just feel like it's too complicated. So I hope that I'm going to break this down for you in a way that you guys can understand. If you guys can imagine the stock market, uh, Imagine a bunch of buckets, okay, with all of these companies and every company has a bucket out there and inside that bucket is ownership. So us as advisors, we like to call them shares. And while utilizing the stock market, we can buy and sell a little bit of ownership, aka shares in these companies. So that means that everyday people like you, like me, we have the opportunity to be investors in our economy. When we spend money and everything's going really well and you're feeling really good, the values of these companies go up, right? But when something bad happens like a pandemic or a war or a bad economic report, we, we tend to stop spending as much and we pull back and we say, oh, this doesn't really feel safe right now, so I'm just going to hold on this money until it gets better. But here's the thing. When you do that, when you see that the values of these companies start to go down, hence the fear, this is the time you need to keep investing. I tell people this all the time. When the market goes down, imagine it just like on a big old sale. You have all these buckets and all these shares inside them are on sale and you get to buy more shares with the same amount of money than when you were buying them when they were not on sale, when things in our economy were going great. When you do this, when you continuously invest, whether the market is up or whether it's down, you will watch it go back up, right? So um, when people people are fearful and they want to invest only when the market is good, they miss out on all that potential growth that they could have had. Which leads me to why patterns matter. Patterns lead to predictability. When I talk to people who are too afraid to invest, it's because they have seen what it has done in prior years. And that's pretty scary, right? So we're talking our 2008 crisis and then again in 2020. We advisors cannot predict when these events will occur with the stock market, but when they do happen, we can plan accordingly and look at past performance, which also helps us predict the future performance. Um, also, understanding that patterns make everything a little less scary when drops occur because we know based off the past that when things drop, they must cut, they come back up again, right? So understanding this pattern is important because too many people fixate on the negatives. They focus on when the market is down and they miss on all of that opportunity it had to come back up. So speaking of patterns, which brings me to my next point of discussion. On our next slide, I'm going to show you the performance history of the S&P 500 since 1976. And this will hopefully help you better understand and make you feel a little bit more confident when it comes to investing and why patterns matter. So I think I have a laser pointer on this thing. 
Let me see if I can't get it to work. Oh, laser pointer. Ah, ta -da. All right, so again, the S&P 500 has been around since 1957. This is a stock market index to track the value of the 500 largest publicly traded corporations that have their stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, okay? The S&P 500 is a super good economic indicator of how we are doing as a whole. Think of it as a measuring stick that shows how our economy is doing, okay? You can see the dip here, right here in 2008, and again here in 2020. And the reason for me to show you this is because I want you to see the overall picture here, okay? Patterns matter. Yes, this is absolutely 100% a roller coaster when you are riding it. But if you can see the overall trend here is to continue to go up. Never once has the stock market completely diminished off the face of the earth. Has had some very scary times, sure. But the only people who lost out on those scary times are the people that took their money out and lost on all the potential growth that they when it came back. OK, so I'm showing you this again because patterns matter, past performance matter. If I'm here investing in the S&P 500, I am not going to be freaking out and pulling my money out when it takes a dive, 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 because I understand that what's, what goes down must come back up. Now, I can't tell you how long it will take to come back up, but judging based off the past, I know this to be true. I know my daughter is going to be coming into my room in the middle of the night. I know this is coming. I should not be scared. I should expect it when that tiny little four foot shadow is next to my bed, right? But I can be a little scared. I just, I shouldn't be doing anything drastic when I see that tonight. <laughs> so now this leads me to one of my favorite parts here. We've talked about myths. We've talked about in, uh, when it comes to investing, things that we don't need, facing our fears with facts. And now I'm going to show you a hypothetical illustration of what investing can do for you. This is a hypothetical illustration that I made for you guys today, and it's going to dive a little bit deeper. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll dive deeper into investment options on our next slide. But for this slide, I want you guys just to pretend like this is a Roth IRA, okay? For those of you who don't know, a Roth IRA is an individual retirement retirement account that uses your after-tax dollars to invest. Therefore, all of the growth and the distributions when you go to retire are going to be completely tax-free. Uh, for year 2023, the maximum contribution limit for a Roth IRA is $6,500. For, so for the sake of this illustration, let's pretend I invested in a Roth IRA, okay? And in this illustration, we are investing in just the S&P 500 index, okay? We just got discussing the S&P, what the S&P 500 is, and now this is an index that tracks the S&P 500. So you can see the ticker right there on the right of the screen and the fund name. So should you guys wanna go look this up on your own time, but for the sake of keeping this simple, here are a couple of the, some of, or here are a couple of the illustration facts I really wanna point out. Um, first thing is this shows somebody starting to invest 30 years ago. So in 1993, that's where this date comes from, which an initial investment of $6,500. So that's just like maxing out your Roth IRA, okay? And after that initial investment, they proceed to invest $540 a month for the next 30 years, okay? That's just like maxing out your Roth IRA account every year, okay? I always call this my bare minimum investment. I'll tell you guys a little bit why later. But doing this over the course of 30 years lands you with $1.07 million as the final market value, guys, when you only put in a little over $200,000. So this is the amount you invested. This is all of the growth that's possible. And I love showing this hypothetical illustration to people because this is when people really start to believe that wealth is possible. Because in the grand scheme of things, $6,500 a year isn't that much. And the crazy part of this whole scenario is this is only looking at one account. This is strictly maxing out your Roth IRA. This does not include if you're contributing to your 401k. This does not include if your spouse is also maxing out their Roth IRA if you're married. I like to call this my bare minimum investment because in my house, this is one of our non-negotiable line items in our budget. No matter what is going on, we are continuously contributing to our Roth IRA to max it out every single year because we know, we know what it's going to give us in the future, right? So 
With that, now let's switch and talk about some of these investment and in vehicles that you guys can utilize to start building your wealth. And I want to emphasize that these are not all of the options out there, but these are just a few that um, everybody on this call I know should probably have access to. So these options gear more towards the stock market and investing rather than investing in a tangible item such as real estate land other properties etc i personally i love real estate however i also feel that there are a lot of different ways you can go about investing in that in order to build wealth and every person's situation is so different that for the sake of keeping this webinar to my time i'm going to dive i'm not going to dive deep into real estate today okay uh, first investment option is we have our employer sponsored plans. These options are offered to you at your employer to invest for your retirement. These are great options for you to get started with investing consistently since contributions come directly out of your pay. Super great option. Second option we have here is a traditional and a Roth IRA. A lot of people get these mixed up with employer sponsored plans. These are separate individual retirement accounts, okay? These have nothing to do with your employer. This is an investment account that you can open for yourself and contribute for yourself. Maximum contribution limits for 2023 are $6,500. They upped the contribution limit for 2024 to be 7,000. So that's really exciting. If anyone on this call has a Roth IRA or a traditional, they just bumped up that contribution there for next year. Um, third investment option that I wanna talk about is a non-qualified account. So this is an after tax dollar account. So just like a Roth IRA, however, you are going to pay taxes on the capital gains of that account. And this is more geared towards investors who want to do even more than just their employer sponsored plan and their traditional or Roth IRAs. So we've talked about some investment options that you guys can start utilizing today. Very easy. All of you on this call should have access to at least one of these options. Now I'm going to dive a little bit into my uh, millionaire study that I was researching for this call. I showed you that hypothetical millionaire illustration. We talked about overcoming our fears of the stock market with facts. We debunked some myth. This is another one of my favorite parts because it talks about actual statistics of millionaires in this country. These facts were pulled from Ramsey Solutions National Study of Millionaires, where they surveyed over 10,000 millionaires here in America. It's by far the largest study done on millionaires to date. And if you want to take a deeper dive into that study, you can go look at their research on their website. But for this webinar, I just pulled a few that I felt held the most power for inspiration. Okay. First truth is that one out of uh, sorry, eight out of 10 millionaires invested in their company's 401k. This is something available to everyone whose company offers an employer employer sponsored plan. We just got done talking about that being one of the investment options to utilize. And now we learn that eight out of 10 millionaires in this country use that to build wealth. Second truth, according to the study, 75% of the millionaires at attribute their success to consistent and regular investing, which leads me to the third truth. This means that becoming a millionaire overnight or through a brilliant idea is rare rather than the norm. It's essential to keep this in your mind because it's a very common perception of a wealthy individual. It's often based off stories of overnight successes or entrepreneurs who make millions of dollars in a short period of time. These instances can contribute to wealth, but they are infrequent in the study of millionaires. The truth of the matter is, is that building wealth, again, is a marathon. It's not a race. Marathon runners prep years in advance just to be able to participate in this race, to be successful. They must prep themselves, their bodies, their breathing, just to be able to run the race. And if you want to participate in wealth in this wealth building marathon, you need to prep yourself before you start running too. That means you need to be able to put yourself in a position to build wealth. That means getting rid of some of those roadblocks we talked about earlier and just starting wherever you can. It's important to recognize that you 
have the ability to start this journey regardless of wherever your starting point is in life right now, okay? It is never too late to begin. The only ones who fail in this endeavor are those who choose not to participate at all. Another fact I found in this national study of millionaires are the five top five career paths for millionaires and the one so we have an engineer we have an accountant we have a teacher a management and attorney okay the one that stood out to me the most was a teacher teachers are not known for generating a large income in fact act they're severely underpaid in my opinion yet they are the top three career paths for millionaires today i put these in order one two three four five okay that alone should tell you that this does not matter what your income is, it's what you decide to do with it that matters. Your number one wealth building tool is your income. You get to choose what your future is going to look like. And it's hard for some of us to picture being wealthy because maybe you didn't come from a home where you had made where you had money. Maybe your family struggled growing up and you just believed that lie that because you didn't come from wealth, you can't be wealthy. And I've seen this over and over again, but that does not take a genius to do this. All it requires is consistent investing over time and having someone in your corner who is going to help encourage you and help you understand when your questions arise. So with that, I'm gonna end with this, is how clear are your goals? I find that everyone I talk to has dreams, yet there are very few people who are crystal clear with how to make that dream a reality. The biggest stumbling block between you and your dreams to wealth is you. A lot of people don't realize that. We just learned that building wealth is a marathon. It takes preparation, but most importantly, it takes consistency and time. This is not a webinar where I'm gonna teach you to have an overnight success. This is where I'm gonna give you the tools to help motivate you, showing you the stats on the largest study done to millionaires to date was not only to show you that this can be done, but more importantly, show, more importantly show you that ordinary people doing average things are building wealth. And if your dream is to retire at 50, are you willing to increase your contributions now to get there? Are you willing to go all in to pay off your debt so you can build some margin in your budget? This is when everyone starts to look at me. When I start asking these questions to people, when they give me their goals and their dreams, and then I kind of shoot back to them, well, are you willing to do the X, Y, and Z? They look at me and they go, mm, I'm not willing to do that. Yet every successful person that I've ever met had to sacrifice something prior to being successful. This is a, it is a very, very rare occurrence that people win the lottery and they get all their dreams and wealth handed to them. And in fact, statistically, they end up losing all their money within three to four years because they did not create a discipline and a stamina to keep it. That prep work to building wealth is so important. It's going to help you build that stand on that discipline that you need in order to keep going and finish the race. One of my biggest dreams ever since I started having kids was to be able to retire early enough to travel with them. I have, for those on this call who don't know me, I have four daughters at home. Um, my dream is just to be with them wherever they are in the country and just to travel where wherever they are. My husband always jokes and he makes fun that I'm gonna be a Nana on wheels <laughs> because I talked about purchasing a fifth wheel and just being able to go wherever our kids are and just adventuring with them along the way. And I can see this dream. I can see this dream so clearly that every time I talk about it, every time I think about it, I get emotional. That very specific vision is what continues to drive me and has been since even before our income started growing. It doesn't matter how much you start with. I'm gonna keep saying that. The only thing that matters with building wealth is investing consistently over a long, period of time. The only people that lose in this game are the people that never start. When your goals are crystal clear, this is what's going to drive you to keep going when you're just feeling that fatigue of, man, am I ever going to get there? So 
I love hearing some of your guys' goals and your dreams, and I love personally being able to achieve them, to be alongside of you during this wealth building journey. And if you're ready and you're prepared to start running this marathon, I just wanna encourage you that we have an entire team here at Kerberos Wealth Management, including myself, who are ready to just run alongside of you to meet all those goals and support you along the way. So on that front, Autumn, my webinar is done. So if we had any questions, I can answer those now. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Please reach out to me. Let me know what you think. If you want to have a meeting with me, we can set that up. I'd love to chat with you guys, um, but I'm going to hand it over to Autumn. Thanks, Alex. So we don't have any um, questions in the Q&A right now. So if you do have any questions for Alex, now would be the time to pop those into the chat and send us our way. Um, we do have a bit of extra time here, so we're able to answer um, as many questions as we can fit, right? Um, we did have one question come through prior to the beginning of the webinar. Um, so Alex, maybe you can walk us through is buying real estate a good idea to build wealth? So for example, maybe purchasing rentals or land or starting Airbnbs, what are your thoughts on building wealth through buying real estate? So I, I really love the idea of real estate. I don't have a problem with it. It's a very in thing right now to get real estate to buy a fixer upper you know and then put a renter in there my biggest issue that i have is with, with real estate is when people go into it they purchase the home on a mortgage and they go into it saying well if i put a renter in here the renter is going to pay my mortgage well what happens when the renter is not there because just because you have a lease and you have a contract doesn't mean that they're going to stay right? I mean, you have to take them to court if they are not there and paying and all these things and you lose out. And now who's in charge of the mortgage? You are. So if you are going to buy a home and you're not going to pay cash for it, um, I don't encourage that. But if people really, really, really want to do it, I just make sure I say, make sure you have a fully funded emergency fund for that home. So if there isn't a renter in there, you're not putting yourself in a situation where you can't afford the mortgage for that home. That's my biggest caveat to rental. I love it. I think it's great. I would love to get into that in the future. However, right now I'm more focused on my personal employer's sponsored plan and maxing out my Roth account every year. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I just have a few questions here. Um, so how do you or what would you what advice would you give to someone who um, is maybe like psychologically comfortable with debt? So let's say they um, they they use their credit cards on a regular basis um, and they're OK with not paying them off every month. That's just something they've gotten used to. What is your advice to people um, who maybe have thought previously um, maybe their previously instilled beliefs, right? That debt teaches them how to save money and how to how to build their wealth, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, my if I was sitting down with someone right now, I would probably, and they had that mindset, I would probably ask my first question would be like, how's that going for you? <laughs> just because I, I just know from you guys, if you haven't watched my Overcoming Debt and Building Wealth webinar, I kind of share on there my personal story of how I got to where our family was drowning in debt. And I had this mindset where I don't need to make the payment or you know, I'll just swipe it and deal with it another day. But that never puts you in a good position, right? And you don't go to bed feeling good and safe and secure every single night. So I would say if you're in that mindset um, to maybe reach out to someone who is not in that mindset to kind of give you some perspective and clarity on that. Thank you. Um, we did have another question come through. What books um, or classes might you recommend for people just starting out their, their wealth journey? Yeah, so the very first book that I read 
uh, when I started learning about finances and personal finances was Dave Ramsey's uh, Total Money Makeover. I read that book within 24 hours. It changed my life. Um, it changed the way not only did I handle my finances, it changed the way I parent my children. It changed the way I talked to my husband. It changed the way I viewed uh, online ordering and shopping and using my debit card and credit cards and everything like that. So I would highly encourage you if you're at the very, very beginning to start out with that book. And then obviously if you're at, you know, you can, reach out to me as well, and I'd be happy to help walk alongside that journey as well. Awesome. Um, one more question coming through here. So what is your opinion on investing in cryptocurrency? I feel like I knew this question was going to pop up today. <laughs> <laughs> I personally, I'm going to be honest, I do not invest in crypto. I don't. It has not been around long enough for me to feel comfortable with that. So I'm not going to get into investment recommendations on this call. I will tell you what I'm personally not doing, um, and I'm not doing crypto at this time. So. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so I guess maybe just, I know you have a lot of resources out there. Um, you have your monthly um, Beautifully Frugal blog in which you discuss your personal experience with um, getting out of debt and becoming financially stable. So maybe out of that experience, that wealth of experience that you have, what are the top maybe three action steps that you would give to someone starting out their financial freedom journey? Oh, as a mom who used to be a stay at home mom, um, my first step to budgeting and creating some margin in my life was to stop going to Target and Starbucks. <laughs> uh, whatever your Achilles heel is, whether that be shopping on Amazon or going to get a coffee every day or something, challenge yourself to dropping one thing in your life and seeing what that does for you. Maybe that $5 coffee every day, you're like, you know what, I'm gonna make coffee at home and I'm gonna keep that $5 and then save it up for the month and then see how much you have and then utilize that either to pay off some roadblocks or to build your wealth and start from there to build yourself in that habit. That's the first thing that I did. I stopped going to Target and I stopped buying Starbucks until I created the discipline in order to get me to the point now where I can walk into Target and I do not feel this incessant need to buy something. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else on this call feels that way when they walk into Target, but I definitely did. So that was this big old sucker for Target. Um, the second thing I did was I surrounded myself with people who I wanted to emulate. I surrounded myself with people who I viewed as successful on the inside. And that helped change me as well, because I knew that if I hung around these people long enough, that I'd want to be like them. And I definitely, it, it is so true. You are who you hang around, okay? That statement has never been more true because I look at who I was hanging around with, you know, years and years ago when I was drowning in debt and all these things. And I'm like, man, I was hanging out with a lot of people who had this mindset of, oh, I just got a bonus. Let's spend it all. Um, instead of people, you know, now when you, if we ever receive a bonus, it's what can I do to get me closer to my financial goal or to get me closer to that vacation or whatever the goal is in our life right now. So those are a few things that I did personally when I started out with my financial journey. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. I think that those are really realistic things that everybody can do, um, even if they might hurt a little bit in the beginning. Um, really great long term effects of, of starting out that way. So I'll just give it another maybe 15 seconds here if there's any last minute questions. Um, otherwise, while those are coming through, I just want to thank everybody for joining today. Um, Alex is very passionate about what she does and helping individuals reach their own um, definition of financial freedom. So 
Um, we, as previously mentioned, Alex does these webinars every once in a while. She also is one of our financial wellness advocates, so she will sit down with you and create your own personalized um, financial wellness plan. So I did pop her contact information into the chat here if you want to write that down. Otherwise, um, it's also in all of the webinar materials that were sent out to your email. Finally, Alex does do a monthly blog in which she gives away free tips and tricks on how to um, make approaching your journey to building wealth a bit easier. So again, pulling from her experience and all of the things that she has already learned um, to help you get there faster. So definitely watch out for that over on our Kerberos Wealth Management page um, and follow along on our socials um, as Alex is also very active there too. So not seeing any new questions come in. So um, with that, I think, Alex, if you have any closing remarks, I'll let you take that away. No, uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining on. Let me know what you think. I love to hear what y'all think of my webinars after them, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.